Contemporary Epistemology, Chapter 5 of Bruce Waller's Consider Philosophy. Epistemology began as a search for certainty, an attempt to discover the absolute truth. The Enlightenment challenged the traditional role of epistemology by demonstrating the difficulty of achieving certainty, as well as the utility of relativity. The ancient Greeks found comfort in absolutes, unchanging categories, arguing the change was an inferior state. While some philosophers, such as Hegel, attempted to maintain his search for absolutes, many thinkers began to embrace as a change as natural and as positive. While the last 300 years have been a time of change culturally, politically, and scientifically, the most influential concept in bringing about this shift in thought was the theory of evolution. Once generally accepted, evolution demonstrated that natural change is always occurring, changes which alter the concept of truth and cause some to question its very existence. Pragmatism is a uniquely American philosophy whose link to science is going to propel epistemology forward. The originator, the creator of pragmatism, was Charles Peirce, and Peirce was a working scientist rather than a trained philosopher, although he did claim that he read Kant for an hour every night. But Peirce defined truth as conformity of things to their principles. That's all the truth is, conformity of things to their principles. While Peirce believed that absolute reality probably did exist, he also argued that it was, at least at present, useless because that reality may not resemble the observable world in which we live. And as a result, one should concern ourselves simply with what works or with what is useful rather than the absolute. Truth is going to change in a changing world. Peirce, as an American thinker, as a scientist, understands that knowledge comes to us through a process of exploration. We formulate a hypothesis. We test that hypothesis. We see if it works. Now that knowledge that we've gained, if it works, he says, that's great. Let's use it. Let's take advantage of it. But we shouldn't assume automatically that this is some kind of absolute knowledge. Knowledge is going to change over the course of time. So, we may gain a piece of knowledge now, and it works, so we're going to use it. But when it stops using, we may uh, working rather, we may have to go back to the drawing board, formulate a new hypothesis, develop a new piece of knowledge, and so forth. To help us uh, along with this, first develop what is called the pragmatic movement of inquiry. We begin with a basic state of firstness, in which we enjoy a contented moment of bliss, secure in our beliefs. All right, so it's a very comfortable state of belief. It's what we like. It's where we want to be. This is us with all of our background knowledge, all the stuff we've read, all the stuff that we've heard. And we carry this knowledge around with us, and it all fits neatly together in our basic web of beliefs. And we're content. We're happy with that. But then a problem will erupt that can't be solved under our present belief set. And that problem is going to induce doubt. This is what's known as secondness. Right? Secondness is a very uncomfortable state. We don't like doubt. Doubt makes us question things. Doubt makes us challenge the foundations upon which our knowledge is built. And so we seek to eliminate or eradicate that doubt. Uh, we want to solve that problem. And so, in that scientific fashion, we have to formulate and test a hypothesis. If it's successful, then we'd move on to the state of thirdness. If it isn't, then we'd have to go back to the drawing board and try to find a solution to the problem. But that secondness is simply trying to overcome that sense of doubt. If we move on to the state of thirdness, that is new knowledge. New knowledge, which eventually, you know, it's going to at first sit in the forefront of our mind, but eventually it'll return back to that comfortable state of belief. It'll become part of our firstness. It'll enrich that within us. 
And so this is that basic process. But again, this newly acquired knowledge, while it is useful to the moment, should not be taken as absolute, but simply as a solution which works. As an example, let's imagine that here you are driving down the road in your 1974 Chevy Vega, got the Doobie Brothers blaring on the radio, you're having a good time, you're in that perfect state of contented happiness, that state of firstness, no problems in the world. But all of a sudden, you hear this thump sound, and you have to pull off to the side of the road. Well, now you've shattered that state of contentedness. You've lost that happy position of firstness, and you've entered into the state of secondness because you've got a problem now. In this case, a flat tire. Now, suppose this has never happened to you before. You have no idea what to do. Well, you have to formulate, if I've got a flat tire and I want to travel on, I have to fix the flat tire. So, how do I do that? Well, okay, we've got this spare tire back here in the boot. Let's pull that out. How can I put the new tire on? Well, let's try to yank the, the tire off. No, that doesn't work. Uh, well, how about if we remove these lug nuts first and then try to yank it off? No, that still doesn't really work. I know, how about if we jack it up first? Okay, now we can take the tire off, we can put the new wheel back on, and before long we'll be on our way. So having worked through that process, we figured out how to eliminate that uncomfortable situation. And now we're back in an original position. But now we also have this new knowledge, the state of thirdness. And we're back in the car, cruising along, very happy, very content again. And for a while, that new knowledge is going to sit there in the forefront of our mind. And should this problem happen again, we won't have to go through that process, because it's right there in our basic knowledge. We know exactly what to do. But again, we shouldn't assume that this knowledge is absolute in any way, because maybe years go by and now we're driving around in maybe a 2000 uh, Chrysler LeBaron and we hear that sound thump boom 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 and now what we think ah tires gone I know exactly what to do we get out to do it but we find that we can't because something's changed something's altered the LeBaron has a wheel lock the Chevy Vega didn't so now there's a new process that we'd have to go through. We'd have to try to figure out what is it that we need to do. And we'd go through that process again, and once we figure out how to do it, then again that becomes our new state of thirdness, this new knowledge. So in essence, as society advances, as technology advances, our knowledge has to advance along with it. And the pragmatic movement of inquiry gives us the ability to allow that to happen. William James was a colleague and close friend of Charles Peirce, and he transformed pragmatism into a theory of truth by uh, eliminating the possibility of absolute reality. James described Peirce's view as a block universe in which everything was predetermined. Right? So his thought was that if you look at things the way that uh, Charles Peirce did, where there is absolute truth, where there is absolute knowledge to be found, then, and, and we're simply moving towards it, then what we're doing is living in a world where we're simply waiting to catch up to truth. But everything's already there. It's already pre-established. So basically what we do has little value. On the other hand, James said that his view was a pluralistic universe a universe that's completely open-ended. If we want to discover truth, we merely need to examine a proposition's fruitfulness. Right? Does it work? If it works, then it is true. James's work led the uh, philosopher John Dewey to boldly reject, e reject even the possibility of a final truth and to define truth itself as warranted assertability. 
If I am justified in asserting this as the truth, then it is. More recent pragmatists have divided themselves along these same lines. Uh, Wilfred Sellers, for example, followed in the tradition established by Charles Peirce. He believed that while we should simply operate from the standpoint of utility, what is useful now is what we should be using, he did believe that there was an absolute truth that we would eventually come across. And he even referred to the end of his inquiry as CSP, or Conceptual Scheme Purse. Richard Rorty, on the other hand, claimed John Dewey as an inspiration and said regardless of the end goal, um, there is no absolute truth to be found and even if there were, there's no way we'd ever know that we've achieved it. It's not like there's a signpost that says stop, you've reached the end of inquiry, you know everything there is to know. We could sit at a piece of knowledge for 5,000 years and believe this to be absolute, but then something changes and we'd have to alter that understanding. So even if there were an absolute, it wouldn't do us any good. We should operate just from that standpoint of utility. But regardless of the end goal, pragmatism has moved epistemology away from the quest for certainty and has replaced it with a quest for utility in common sense and what, after all, is a more American philosophical concept than that. <laughs>